Oh, good afternoon. Thank you for uh, finding the room and making your way down the escalator and, uh, and coming here. My name is Sander Temma. I am, as of last week, a uh, senior product line manager for Talos Security. Before that, I was a sales engineer. Um, I think they made me a senior product line manager because of what they had to pay me to take the job. Um, anyway, I also contribute to the Apache HTTP server project. I have been active on infrastructure, although not as active as of late. Um, and so that's, that's what I do in my, uh, in my copious spare time. So I would like to start, as we gather here today, fellow Americans, fellow non-Americans, because I am both, the state of our SSL union is strong. And the reason I say that is that re research has shown that if you don't say it, you don't get re-elected. Right, so, okay, we, what, what do we have? We have the most popular transport security mechanism in use. The protocol has never been under more scrutiny. And more and more popular websites start to default to using SSL. In fact, the Electronic Frontier Foundation late last year did a little survey on a bunch of popular sites and services to see how they were adopting various encryption technologies, including SSL. And um, of course, the green check marks are better. The red X is not so much. They have uh, been updating this uh, page, not the infographic, but the page itself. So do check the URL if you want to find out how your favorite site is doing. For instance, Yahoo is now doing much better. So what do we talk about? Uh, we will talk about uh, a little bit about the protocol, the protocol and its limitations, some recent security developments, and of course at that point we will uh, address the elephant in the room, um, and um, talk a little bit about how some of um, some open source projects, uh, there are uh, seats in front, guys, if you want to uh, use an actual chair. Um, now, some open source projects that we know and love may not have done so well in uh, their use of SSL. Um, we'll uh, spin up a little um, public key infrastructure uh, configuration that will help us, uh, hopefully help us overcome that, uh, those problems. And at the end, I hope to have some questions, uh, questions, answers, a little uh, discussion time permitting. So, um, point of order, when I say SSL, I do also mean its uh, successor, TLS, Transport Layer Security. Since uh, TLS version 1 was uh, SSL version 3.1, so their protocols are strongly, strongly related. So when I say SSL, I mean TLS. When I say TLS, I, in many cases, also mean SSL. So the protocol. Uh, what does the protocol do for us? The protocol allows us to authenticate endpoints and encrypt the communications between them. And how does it do that? A little bit of a refresher on how the protocol works. We distinguish a client and a server. The client could be a web browser, it could be an app that needs to reach out to a server endpoint to get some data, post some data, and so on and so forth. The client connects to a server and when it wants to talk SSL, it starts with a client, hello, hello, I want to talk SSL with you. The server responds by identifying itself with a certificate. This certificate can then be validated, can then be verified by the client. And when the client positively verifies that certificate, what it does next is it takes a little piece of data, I'm calling it for the purpose of this short discussion, the secret Scooby snack, encrypts that with the public key contained in the certificate and sends it over the wire to the server. The server, since it owns the private key that goes with that public key, can decrypt the secret Scooby snack, then both client and server go into a session key derivation function. Since they have the same data, they can derive the same session keys whereupon they start to do encrypted communications. So that's how we do both authentication and encryption. Now, a couple of limitations of the protocol. Of course, the protocol only encrypts and authenticates traffic while it's in transit before it's sent on the client, after it's received on the server, and vice versa, that data is in the clear. If you successfully attack the endpoints, you can still um, obtain the data. Secondly, the authentication happens with um, public key certificates. And public key certificates actually turns out to be kind of a hard topic to do well. 
if you don't do the verification, the dissemination, the management of the certificates well, you weaken your security posture. Um, to wit, to do this on the open web, we need to build in blind trust in certificate authorities. But let's take a step back and see what happens when the certificate uh, process is not done well. This is actually my own website. This is what you get when you access my vanity blog over SSL. Um, it does not have a trusted certificate unless you happen to download the cacert.org route into your browser. At that point, it will just work because that's where I got the certificate from because they're free. When a client cannot verify the certificate, and it verifies several attributes, it verifies the host name, it verifies the validity period, it verifies the capabilities of the certificate. Is this certificate actually allowed to identify an SSL website? And it uh, validates the trust chain up to a trusted root. If that doesn't work out, the browser will protest. The browser will put up a scary page that says this connection is untrusted. Different browsers do this different ways. Some of them more or less obtuse. This is actually about the best you can get. This is, of course, Firefox, which tells you very, in very clear language that this connection is untrusted. Of course, it can't really tell you why without using all kinds of terminology and language that, um, as laypersons, we are not supposed to have to worry about. Just does tell us that it's untrusted and tells us to please get me out of here. If you really want to, you can click through. It's very tempting to click through this because usually you access a site like this or any other site because you need to access it. You need to get something done. Maybe you need to get your job done. Maybe you get, need to get some timely data. Very tempting to click through certificate warnings. You, well, so that may not be a big deal. Or it may be a very big deal and you get man in the middle. Another uh, example, um, this is the National Institute for Standards and Technology, the uh, uh, cryptographic module research group, which from my professional point of view, I do uh, access a lot. If that site works normally over regular plain text HTTP. If I access it over HTTPS, I am presented with a certificate that's not only for the wrong host name, it's for www.nist.gov and not csrc.nist.gov, but it also expired in January. And of course, we know that our government is broke, but you can't tell me that they don't have the money to get a new certificate. Actually, if you go to www.nist.gov over SSL, you're presented with the renewed certificate. So they have it, they just didn't put it on this virtual host. This is why this is hard, because there are so many moving parts that you need to keep track of. And of course, I'd like to show this security triad. Uh, how many people in the room identify themselves as security practitioners? as opposed to, yep, operations people, developers. Okay, so we have, we, we have a good mix of all three. So, of course, as operation people, you are concerned with availability, keeping your service available, making sure that you don't get the midnight phone call that your service is inaccessible, for instance, because of an expired certificate. As security practitioner, you're concerned with confidentiality and integrity. Confidentiality, only authorized parties should see the data and nobody else should. Integrity, the parties that do have the authorization to access the data, need to rest assured that the data is not been tampered with. Okay, how about the trust in certificate authorities? The problem with the open web is that all our web browsers and our operating systems blindly trust a list of over 100 certificate authorities from all corners of the world. Uh, these certificate authorities may be commercial entities like VeriSign or Thought, which is now owned by VeriSign, or a GeoTrust, which is now owned by VeriSign, or um, DigiCert or Commodo, or um, um, various nation states have their own certificate authorities that are also in the certificate store of all the popular browsers. Our browser trusts all of those certificate authorities to issue certificates for any domain in the world. It makes no distinction to whether or not that certificate authority was supposed to issue that certificate or not. So, a couple of years ago, this was a couple of years ago, yeah, this was 2011, users, Gmail users in Iran 
suddenly saw Gmail switch certificate provider from whatever Google was using at the time to this obscure Dutch state certificate authority. Well, Google has certainly never ordered certificates from that state certificate authority, so it was apparent that something was wrong. It turned out that the state certificate authority called DigiNotar had been subverted, had been tricked into issuing certificates not only for Gmail, but also for Yahoo Mail. And the strong suspicion is, of course, that a certain nation state was men in the middling their own users, their own uh, citizens, and sniffing on their emails. Little crude, but apparently it worked. Um, of course, we all know what happened. DigiNotar unfortunately went out of business, um, which was a, um, a big problem in Holland where um, DigiNotar not only secured the, uh, the local equivalent of the DMV, but also a movement of perishable goods through the port of Rotterdam and um, international power grid ex uh, exchanges of energy. So uh, all of those certificates had to be renewed on very short notice through another certificate authority that wasn't DigiNotar. So what's new? What's new and different? Okay, of course the protocol is and has ever been under attack. Uh, cryptograph, cryptography works this way. A cryptographic protocol or a cryptographic function is under constant tests by adversaries who try to trick it into revealing data or revealing keys or otherwise doing things that the protocol wasn't designed to do. You can't prove cryptography positive. You can't prove it's secure. The only thing you can do is attack it and prove that it's insecure. Sometimes this works. When that happens, um, we need to fix it. There are various attacks on SSL, which I encourage you to Google. We're not going into these because we don't have the time for it. But uh, the main uh, tenor is that we Probably in this room, we are not cryptographers, myself included. We consume the crypto, but we use the math, but we don't invent the cryptography, nor can we be called upon to verify the protocols or, or actively attack them. So what we, the only thing we can do is we can consume the headlines that appear when an attack has happened. And of course, it's very important to keep in mind that the headlines are constructed to make us watch the ads. It may be that they sometimes are a little bit more dramatic than they need to be, and we need to keep that into account. Fortunately, most attacks are responsibly disclosed, which means that we only learn of the attack after it's been fixed, and we have had an opportunity to download the fixes. This is how it's supposed to work. Attacks, I would argue, are good, though painful. There is no better disinfectant than daylight. Keeping, making attacks openly available, making the fixes openly available, makes us all stronger. And when the flaw gets fixed in a protocol or a library that we all use, etc., we use the new updated version and we all benefit. Of course, yes, mitigating attacks is painful. We need a plan for that. And this is you know, where the security practice comes in. Security means planning for possible issues and how to respond to them. And this is where we come to the elephant in the room because, of course, this week, in fact, over the weekend, we learned that the popular OpenSSL library has been subverted in a particularly nefarious way. Actually, it's not been subverted. Turns out that there was a bounce check problem in the library that has been there since 2011 and that only this weekend uh, we became aware of, we as the larger community, because that's when the, the fix went in. Stephen Henson pushed it to its, uh, committed it to its, his private Git repository on Saturday, pushed it out on Sunday, and on Monday we all knew about it. So this is a very unpleasant surprise. This is a problem with a um, protocol extension called the Heartbeat. Uh, I had never, frankly, never heard of the Heartbeat. I still don't even know what it does, but apparently um, if you have a vulnerable version of OpenSSL, which is anything on the 101 release track through 101F, your, an attacker can send heartbeats to your um, SSL server with a, um, 
size parameter that doesn't get checked by the library. So the size parameter is used to construct the response to the heartbeat. And if you make that larger than the protocol intended, then the server will faithfully copy that much memory into the reply and send it to you. This is a very effective way, once you have an SSL connection to a, a server, a very effective way to remotely read the memory of that server. Presumably starting with wherever the pointer to that heartbeat data structure ended up upwards into however much you want to, um, you want to uh, see. The big problem is that not only has this been there since 2011, the exploits are virtually undetectable. You can't see that they are happening because, of course, heartbeats is something that any capable client can send every once in a while. What you could do is, in retrospect, you could configure your IDS to look for suspicious numbers of heartbeats from certain, because a heartbeat is a special record type, SSL record type. You could configure IDS to look for suspicious numbers of heartbeats from certain clients and then you know, raise the alarm, but that's something you can only do in retrospect. And you know, while, while we're at it, why not just fix the problem? So vendors are scrambling. Uh, Red Hat just today released uh, an RPM update of the OpenSSL package. Um, haven't really seen anything from FreeBSD yet. Actually, does FreeBSD ship with 101? Yeah, and they sent out an announcement. Okay. So FreeBSD 10 does ship with OpenSSL 101. Um, anyway, we all get to update, and we are not only get to update, but we also, since the data that could be exposed uh, includes the actual keys of the server, the actual public and private key of the server, uh, we get to rekey all our certificates. And we got to figure out what else could be exposed. And I'll, I ran out of room, so I, I just say, assess and respond to possible intrusion. What could possibly be wrong? Could there have been cookies gone over that connection that have been read? Uh, could there be name, usernames and passwords in that particular block of memory that could have been read? And so on and so forth. As a security practitioner, you get the enviable task of figuring this out and see how far back you need to go in not only suspe suspecting your data, but also resetting passwords and invalidating session cookies and so on and so forth. This is pretty bad. It's fixed now, so, of course, as soon as we all update our libraries. And I've talked to several people over the past couple of days have been very hard at work about at, um, updating their, um, their products and their deployments. But it, um, it needs to be done. Of course, there's a very nicely formatted website, heartbleed.com, where you can read everything about this vulnerability, um, what it does, what it is. That's where I got most of the information I just told you. Um, and yes, have, have, have fun updating all our web servers. I think I'm on 2.2 with 0.9.8. I don't have the problem. It depends on what my hosting provider is running. So let's talk about the um, trust in certificates issue. Because that's, that's also a real issue. That blanket trust of over 100 certificate authorities. There are a couple of initiatives in this direction. I'm going to highlight two. We're going to talk about um, DANE, which stands for DNS-based authentication of named entities. I, I'm, I'm sure that that was a name um, found to fit the acronym. It's an uh, initiative from the Internet Engineering Task Force, the IETF. What does it do? It um, proposes to store in the DNS record, in the domain name so the server record for a domain, a record of which certificate authorities or even which certificate authority keys are allowed to sign certificates for that domain. And the idea is that the domain name server in question is then secured by DNSSEC, so you also have a public private key system to ensure that the, the integrity of your DNS responses. Uh, this is uh, kind of there are some standards now. There's, I, I, I don't know if they're at RFC yet, but there are certainly drafts 
Uh, uptake has been slow because this, of course, needs to be supported by the client. And it needs to be supported by everything in between that deals with the DNS. And for instance, there are home routers, you know, the $50 boxes, Wi-Fi boxes that we all buy and throw in a closet and don't look at for five years. There are home routers that don't deal well with the record response size um, that uh, comes with using DNSSEC. And of course, if you truncate a DNSSEC response, then uh, that uh, response becomes invalid. And suddenly you can't access the website and that is not something you want. So uptake has been slow. Another initiative is certificate transparency. Certificate transparency comes from Google. So the, the logo graphic has all nice primary colors in it. It proposes to establish a registry of known good certificates. This registry can be consulted by certificate by SSL clients like browsers who want to know whether the certificate that was presented by the web server is in fact a valid good certificate. It can then push out the certificate to the registry if it's not already in there. In fact, domain owners can proactively populate the registry with certificates that they have had issued for their domains so that a client already finds the certificate there. So if, for instance, the use case in the DigiNotar hack, the uh, Iranian Gmail users suddenly find a different certificate on their Gmail, that will get noticed much quicker than it was back in 2011. Certificate Transparency has their own website, certificatetransparency.org, and of course these slides are going to be up on SlideShare. Um, a early version is up on the conference website. Yes? Uh, Jeff Trawick has an implementation for certificate transparency for the HTTP server. Yeah. So if you want to play with that, um, talk to Jeff. A couple of protocol developments, and I talk, talk, talk of new protocol developments, but new in quotes because some of them are not all that new. Um, session tickets, well, of course you can, you have, always been able to resume SSL sessions. Once the whole painful Scooby Snack exchange is done and the session keys are derived, client and server can store those session keys, cache them, so that the next time they need to communicate, for instance, if a browser needs to open three more connections real quick to, to, to download images or JavaScript, it can use the existing session keys. Uh, session tickets expands that concept to a point where the server no longer needs to keep a cache of those session keys. Instead, what it does is it has a AES key, an advanced encryption standard key that it uses to encrypt the client's, uh, that particular client's session keys and sends that encrypted blob to the client, which caches it and the next time it wants to connect, it sends the encrypted session keys back to the server, which can then decrypt them and resume the session. So you transfer that state of the uh, encrypted session mostly to the client. The only thing that the server needs to keep is that encryption key. And it can age out sessions by rotating that encryption key. At some point after five minutes, you stop encrypting with that key, but you keep it around for ten, another 10 minutes to decrypt sessions that the clients bring to generate a new key for the next five minutes, and, uh, uh, and so on. HTTPD 2.4 can do this if compiled against a sufficiently recent version of OpenSSL, and I do recommend 101G <laughs> at this point. 098, uh, I don't think it has that. Uh, OCSP stapling, well OCSP is online certificate status protocol. Um, it is a way for clients to obtain the revocation status of a single certificate. The location of the OCSP server is usually embedded in the certificate, so the client knows where to go as soon as the server presents it with that certificate. And uh, the classic use case has been, and this is a graphic from the blog post at Mozilla, I just stole the graphic from there. Um, the classic use case is that the uh, client obtains a certificate from the server, and in this case, the server um, 
is actually an attacker who has stolen the private key of the server and of course has the certificate because that's public data. So it sends that rogue certificate over. The browser will then go and to the OCSP server published in that certificate and get the OCSP response from the certificate authority that says, no, the certificate is no good. We revoked it last week. And that's the end of the story. The client now knows that it doesn't, that it can't trust that server anymore. Of course, the problem with this is that it is a look aside. It is an extra request that the client needs to make in the process of setting up a web server connection. As a web server operator, you want those connections to be fast. Because research has shown, research by Amazon and by Google and by Yahoo, um, that faster sites um, work better and convert more users. So that look aside, which where every client needs to go to a same central point to get that OCSP status, slow that process down. So instead, the server can go to the OCSP responder proactively and get an OCSP response from the certificate authority that is valid for a certain period. And when the client connects, together with the certificate, the server will present the OCSP response. It's like, here's my certificate. And here's my proof that the certificate is actually still valid. And when that OCSP response expires, the only thing that needs to happen is the server goes back to the CA and gets the next OCSP response. Apache 2.4 can do this. It can do this OCSP stapling thing, um, reach out to the certificate authority and get the, um, get the OCSP response proactively. Perfect forward secrecy, or generally forward secrecy. Uh, we talked about the Scooby Snack. Uh, there is a problem with the Scooby Snack. And the problem with the Scooby Snack is that um, we put the encrypted uh, data on the wire that is then used to derive session keys. If at any point in the future, a adversary gets a hold of that server's private key through stealing malfeasance or subpoenas, and they happen to have a sniff of that conversation, they can then go back and decrypt the conversation years after it happened. And you know, we recently learned that there might be entities that do have a collection of data that uh, encapsulates all our previous conversations. So but what do we do about that? Well, we can use a key agreement scheme that does not rely on putting session key input on the wire. And that key agreement scheme is called Diffie-Hellman. Um, Diffie-Hellman, like the popular RSA encryption scheme, Diffie-Hellman was developed in the 70s. Um, and uh, it requires, it does not require any session key input data to traverse the connection. So that means that if you sniff the conversation, you do not have any data that can later be used to reconstruct the session keys and decrypt the data. Secondly, by rotating, periodically rotating those Diffie-Hellman keys, you can make sure that conversations are never exposed because the keys that were used as input for those sessions do not exist. In this case, the only thing that the server private key does is periodically sign a new Diffie-Hellman key. We call this ephemeral Diffie-Hellman because the Diffie-Hellman keys themselves are short-lived. So this is a much more desirable way of um, setting up, of handshaking SSL connections. And for instance, um, Firefox will default to this if given the chance. Um, not sure if Internet Explorer does it yet. I kind of have my doubts about that. Although today, I think today is the day that Internet Explorer 6 is finally dead. Yes. And uh, this process was always, um, previously this process was much more CPU intensive than the RSA alternative. However, since uh, we have started using elliptic curve keys, now um, elliptic curve keys work differently from the uh, classic Diffie-Hellman keys, much less CPU intensive. So it's now actually comparable to what you do with RSA.
So now let's talk about the how open source has stumbled. And what I'm talking about here is this article from uh, October 2012, where a group of researchers from Stanford and from University of Texas in Austin took a whole bunch of open source libraries, so non-browser applications, no user interface, and checked how they did, how well they did at verifying the credentials of the server certificate. And it turned out that many, many client libraries did not do a good job here. And in fact, a number of Apache projects were implicated in this. These are named by name in the article. We have Axis, Axis 2. We have the HTTP client from the, uh, the, the Commons project. We have LibCloud, uh, ActiveMQ, and uh, Celtics Fire, which is now called CXF. That's quite a collection, so we're naturally not impressed. However, uh, of course, things mostly got fixed. Ax the old Axis was abandoned in 2007. Um, Access 2, you can use a different HTTP client implementation. I have, I, I have this from a private conversation with one of the Access developers. Um, I don't know if this is documented anywhere, but um, what he proposed is you use an HTTP client implementation from Synapse, and that apparently does the um, uh, verification correctly. HTTP client 3.x, the one that was implicated, has been end of life. Well, that's easy. The problem is that HTTP client 4.x, which does the hostname verification correctly, uh, is binary not compatible with 3.x, so uptake of HTTP client 4 has been slow. Kind of a problem. LibCloud was fixed very quickly. Uh, ActiveMQ, I actually have no idea. I'm not a web services guy. I'm not a Java guy. I downloaded it. it um, the article says ActiveMQ depends on access too. Um, I don't see that jar in the ActiveMQ distribution. I do see an HTTP client 4.x. So I don't know. If anybody from ActiveMQ is at the conference, I would love to talk to them. CXF, the problem was that there was some sample code in the distribution that turned off hostname verification altogether. This was fixed before the article came out. So that's, that's easy. So all in all, you know, not bad. Okay. All right, so this article actually um, caused me to think, why does this happen? Why do all these developers not bother or miss all of these host name or uh, certificate val validation issues? And I think actually that it probably has something to do with the fact that SSL is not our core competency. Now, if we write an HTTP client or a uh, web services gateway or uh, a message bus, we don't want to worry about the fact that deep down in the bowels of it, it uses SSL. So since, and you know, it's not to say that devel developers that wrote these um, libraries are not smart, it's just completely at right angle with what they are trying to do, which is gatewaying web services and stuff like that. And of course, the SSL security the certificates, the setting up of the SSL, et cetera, is, stands in the way of functional tests. And if you mess with availability, of course, you mess with the core competency. You don't want to do that. So I think it should become easier to test with real certificates. And um, it turns out that setting up a real certificate hierarchy is not that hard. So if we want to do that, um, excuse the graphics. I looked for some clip art that says certificate, but none the none exists. Actually, it probably exists, but I couldn't find it. All right. Well, what we'll make is a root CA certificate, a self-signed certificate. Um, of course, a lot of people who do test with certificates generate a self-signed certificate, and that's it. Problem is, a self-signed certificate does not convey trust and is not how these libraries are supposed to be rolled out in practice. Root CA certificates are used to sign intermediate CAs or issuing CAs, which are used to sign the actual server certificates or what we call leaf nodes. And the way that this ends up in the layout of the client and the server is that the client gets the root certificate so that it can do the validation. This is what it trusts. The server presents its own certificate and it presents the intermediate certificate to tie it back to the root. So I wrote a little script and this is kind of cost Took me a couple hours to write, wrapped around OpenSSL CA, liberally stolen from the CA.sh script that already comes with OpenSSL. 
I just took out a whole bunch of stuff that we didn't need and set up a little sequence of little hierarchy of certificates in the order in which uh, I think they should be, uh, should be signed. So that'll give you a couple of certificates that you can use for tests. And uh, I would like to actually show that instead of going to the next slide. All right, we're back on uh, mirroring. That's great here. I hope that everybody can see what's going on here. We'll do it up here so that we can um, actually see this. And I have clippets for the actual commands I'm going to do. So I call my pkilet.sh with the new root, and it'll make me a root certificate. Oh, I left the dash X in. Great. There we go. So what this does is it makes me a certificate. A root certificate. And now I can do the same, call the same thing with, here give me a new issuing CA. I hard code the certificate data. Which I call US Colorado Apache Software Foundation Organizational Unit is the Apache HTTP Server Project and this is the issuing CA for my PKI lab. And then finally I can make a new certificate for localhost. And before I do that I actually am going to clear, clean up the old ones. So it has now a certificate for my local host. So it has a root CA directory, a issuing CA directory, and it has a leaves directory where my local host key and local host certificates sit. Now I can set up a server. And if I want to spin up a quick server, then a good way to do that is use OpenSSL, as OpenSSL can set up a quick SSL server. Now what? Oh, okay. Yeah, no, the... Uh... There we go. So OpenSSL as server, I tell it to accept a request on port 4433 where I can bind as non-root user. I give it my key, I give it my certificate, I give it the intermediate, the issuing CA certificate, and I tell it to respond with a web page that happens to be sitting in this directory. So if I go to the other side of this and use curl, I can test that situation and see that it Oops, invalid certificates chain. Hmm. Wonder what's going on here. <laughs> there you go. That's the ticket. Of course I can do that. Here, that's a quick fix. Here, it works. Yes, I got that from HTPD. Of course, that's not the way we want it to work. So we can blow away what we just built. And just start over. And build all of these things. It generates a new key. Yes, I can call all of these on the same command line because it just iterates over that. That's one of the things I stole from the OpenSSL thing. And of course, I need to kill the OpenSSL server whose certificate I just erased and restart that. So now let's see if this works. Okay. Insert an invalid certificate chain. Okay. Wow, this worked last week. 
It's demo gods. The demo gods have struck. All right, this can work. I'll be happy to fix this and show it, but we are at 3.10 p.m. and I would like to um, run through to the conclusion where we do maintain that the state of our union is strong, but continuous vigilance is needed. See, I'm back on the script here. Supporting SSL is table stakes. You have to do it. As a client developer, as a server developer, you need it. In fact, my company has a product that has had so far um, no support for encrypted and authenticated client connections. This has never ever been a problem, except for starting last year, customers are starting to react with, what do you mean it doesn't support SSL client communication? So we had to put that in. So as a developer, you need to embrace and test your SSL support. And I think that even though it doesn't appear to work right now, I think that a little script that just quickly spins up a certificate hierarchy for you uh, can help considerably in doing positive and negative tests. So at that point, I would like to uh, invite questions, invite discussion. We have an audience mic, so if anybody has a question, I would uh, uh, appreciate if you could use the mic. Uh, slides are going to be here later this afternoon, hopefully after I um, uh, take out all the copyrighted images. I'll leave in the ones that are common criteria. Yes, go ahead. So as a ops guy, yes. um, I see you talk about all these libraries that are fixed. Well, the devs can go and put in ignore SSL certificate checking and roll it to production. Same issue. So yeah. what I would like to see maybe as an SSL evangelist, talk to the library developers, get them to include like command line options for Java, like a JVM option to force it back on. So when I deploy, you know, I can force it back on to production. So. Yeah, so you mean that the, the library explicitly can uh, turn on and off support for SSL hostname verification in cases where the developers for their own tests, for their own internal tests, do not want to bother with actually putting certificates in place. That is a great idea. Um, would be wonderful, yeah. So uh, one, of, one of the challenges with that, having tried to patch libraries to, to force CN and verification on that, is that a lot of large internal infrastructures don't use DNS. Um, yep. And then you can't resolve a name to an IP to verify the name against the CN, so yes. or the alt names. So, yeah, it's, so it's, uh, it's a big, deep mess. This is a big, deep mess because, yes, you can put IPs in the certificates, but now you Yes, now you have static IPs, and this is something we've been trying to get away from for a long time. So, yeah, and hosts files suck, especially if you want to maintain them over a large number of servers. I have no good answer for that, except for use DNS. Anybody else? Yes. Several months ago, I was reading a news story where um, a U.S. government official, I don't remember if it was a, a congressman or a judge, it was somebody, had said that they didn't understand why um, organizations were allowed to use things like forward security that made it impossible to comply with subpoenas in a future date. And I wanted to get your, uh, I mean, I was shocked when I heard that, but I wanted to see what you thought. Uh, my opinion, and that is my opinion, is that um, we do have a expectation of being secure in our um, properties and affairs where only you know, um, snooping and reading and man in the middle only happens upon probable cause and warrants. And that is something that we have in the Constitution. So you know, much as they can't break down your door, and uh, search your house without due process, um, it seems to stand to reason to me that this extends to online where we can have it. Yes? 
Now, you know, I am not a constitutional lawyer, and but th that that is what sounds reasonable to me. So yes, the notion that people keep um, sniff and keep traffic for um, up to five years in case you're suspected of doing something wrong so that they can go back and see where it came from is uh, absolutely unacceptable to me. Yes? A uh, forward secrecy model that, um, um, you, you know, the forward secrecy model um, would prevent this from happening. Yes, but the fact that they have it doesn't make me sleep better at night. I'd rather they didn't have it. Supposing you or your company consult for stuff like this, what is the single most important thing that you could recommend that any general person can do to improve their, like, you know, private key security and uh, SSL security? Uh, well, uh, as, as, you know, uh, from a company point of view, um, I do have an answer for that. We do have uh, products that put very tight controls on, on the use of cryptographic keys. So you can take out of consideration the notion that your private key gets compromised or gets used by somebody who shouldn't use it. Uh, this is not supposed to be a product pitch, so I didn't put that in here. Um, for uh, for SSL uh, SSL services and servers, you know, the, the product I'm talking about is hardware security modules that are the only authorized entity to generate and use keys for you. Web server would reach out to the hardware security module and it needs something secret done. Apache supports this. Um, any other program that supports open SSL probably supports it if they have the wherewithal to use the OpenSSL engine. Many other uh, APIs use this. And that's, that basically, that solves or that mitigates the problem of um, rogue usage of keys. Uh, doesn't, doesn't solve other problems like, for instance, it doesn't touch the, the, the heart bleed problem that we just talked about. It just reduces what gets leaked now you can't see the private keys. So we don't have a um, end-to-end silver bullet solution either. Uh, what we do, you know, we do a lot of work in PKIs, uh, wrapping security around PKI deployments, and of course that is not done with a 40-line script. That is a project that is uh, months and months of work to get right, to get um, all the I's crossed and the T's dotted and the policies defined and the the distribution points and, and so on set, set up. We have a lot of customers that have in-house PKIs for various purposes like email encryption, Wi-Fi wi uh, station enrollments, et cetera. Um, you know, more security controls on these allow you to have a, a better stance on what happens in your organization. You know, better controls allow the people in your organization to do what they need prevent them from doing what they don't need to do without getting in their way. Um, I think actually, you know, um, as a very broad idea, um, engineering your security so that it allows you to do your work without getting in your way, without putting up unnecessary roadblocks or necessary roadblocks that people will route around is probably the most, the, 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 the best goal you can have there. So if you put something in place, if you put a control in place, if you decide to you know, turn off a service or turn off websites, et cetera, um, you know, be mindful of why you're doing it and, um, and, and, and that you actually need to do it. Anybody else? Yes. Yeah, if you, um, some of the earlier protocols for doing um, uh, verifying certificates, the OSCP, and yes. you know when you do sign it, what, how does the trust for those show up? Aren't you, don't you have a kind of a chicken and egg problem? Uh, you do have a chicken and egg problem with uh, trust of not only OCSP, but also the older uh, certificate revocation lists. And they are signed by the CA, by the certificate authority that issued them. And so that trust rolls up, rolls back into that same certificate store that the client has to anchor its trust. And so in the case of browsers, that is that same monthly collection of over 100 certificate authorities that it blindly trusts.
So the, the heart bleed vulnerability, to be clear, yes. is, is that strictly an open SSL vulnerability? Yes, it so is an implementation error okay. in open SSL 101. Right. Excellent. Okay. Through 101F. 101G has the fix. Okay. So Could while it's possible less? other implementations also have errors in them, yes. it's not known if any of them have that vulnerability. Correct. Okay. Thank you. Yep. In the back. Yes. So OpenSSL is very, very popular. So if you have a hardware load balancer, you can build your own image and actually use your or a computer will do it. Yep. Four questions. Yeah. That's cool. All right. So for the forward secrecy, where you exchange the ephemeral keys um, yes. between client and server. How does that work with um, where you have like a, a load balance scenario? I mean, do you, do you pretty much have to do your your SSL in the load balancer? You can't do it in the end servers? Uh, you have a couple of options. One is for the load balancer term to terminate SSL and be that outward facing um, communications party. And then it can internally re-encrypt using, using SSL sessions that it has with the back end. Uh, that's done. Um, you know, you could also uh, run SSL all the way to your servers and use a load balancer just to route IP at the IP level. Um, you, of course, in that case, you lose a lot of controls that the load balancer can offer, like URL rewriting, routing of applications to different backends, et cetera, because now the load balancer can't see what's going on inside. So that's a, uh, that, that, that's a balance that you have to, uh, a, a trade-off that you have to make. But typically, uh, what, what, what I see happen is the SSL gets terminated on the load balancer and then in the back end. Actually, a lot of people use plain text, but people are actually starting to re-encrypt. If you go straight to the server, you don't terminate the load balancer. Yep. Uh, you lose the capability of resuming that session, yes, unless you, you do some session memcached session store on the back end where you have a trove of session keys that are um, replicated across servers or something like that. Yeah. I think we uh, probably should send you guys to coffee. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you.